Party when KFC came to China, come to my city. <laughs> You 20, 24 people went for the job. Yeah. 23 people were accepted. I was the only one guy. <laughs> Don't stop running towards your dream. I was 30 years old and I was starting to speak around the country. And a business partner that I'd been working with for three or four years, he said, look, I said, dude, I'm a crossover. I'm working on this one vertical. How many, how many of you are dependent upon a vertical? Maybe you're a chiropractor or a dentist or insurance or you're in real estate or you're, you work, you're, you're, you're Sprint, right? And you're, you got this vertical and you're like, dude, I love my vertical. My vertical makes me feel good. My vertical pays the bills. Oh yes, I feel good. I love the vertical. But dude, I, I'm too dependent upon the vertical. And I kept telling this guy, I said, one day I'm gonna cross over to a mass audience. He says, you'll never do it. Nobody ever does it. McGraw-Hill, McGraw-Hill, you know the book publisher, McGraw-Hill? They wouldn't publish a book called Sell or Be Sold because they said it was a sales book. I said, yeah, and I'm gonna sell some books too. National Geographic canceled the Turnaround King. How many of you saw that show? Canceled it. CNBC copied it, picked it up, threw it up on the thing. Look, this is what's gonna happen to you folks. How many of you have a dream? Hey, hey, you got to go get it, okay? Dreams don't happen on couches, and they don't happen in bed. If you're going to realize that dream, you got to go out into the marketplace. You got to meet a new you. You got to go through obstacles and barriers to where it's like, I don't, it doesn't even bother me anymore, right? Elena, 26 phone calls because I wanted to close the deal. She doesn't want to go out with me. I'm too short. Yeah, okay. I'm too short. How short am I at 51,000 feet? <laughs> How short am I now? <laughs> How short am I now? God damn. <laughs> How short am I now? We're going 666 miles an hour right now at 51,000 feet. Huh? 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 How short am I now? <laughs> the, the plane that I bought, it was an expansion decision. The accountant said, it doesn't make any sense, man. You don't fly enough. It's gonna cost you too much. You don't go on those trips. I'm like, dude, am I gonna expand or contract? It's been 30 years, 30 years. It's probably gonna be 30 years for you too. Doubt, uncertainty, insecurities, rejection, disappointment, judgment. It's gonna be 30 years of it. If anybody thinks you're gonna be successful without paying that price, you're wrong. Are you willing to pay the price? By a lot of fail. I failed for funny things that I failed a key primary school test for two times. And I failed uh, um, like uh, two, three times for the middle school, middle schools. And uh, you, you will never believe in, in Hangzhou, my city, there's only one middle school that lasts only one year. It was changed from primary school to middle school because our graduates of our, our, our school, no, univer you, no middle school accept us because we were too bad. Yeah. <laughs> they would become a middle school. <laughs> what effect did it have, though, uh, being rejected? Well, I think we have to get used to it. We're not that good. Even today, we still have a lot of people reject us. I think. Um, when I uh, in the, be, graduated from universities, and before I, you know, for three years I tried to fill in the universities. So I applied jobs for 30 times, got rejected. I went for a police, they said, no, you're not good. I went to even, even the uh, KFC. When KFC came to China, come to my city, <laughs> you 20, <applied. laughs> 24 people went for the job. Yeah. 23 people were accepted. I was the only one guy. <laughs> And we went for police. Five people, four of them accepted. I was the only guy that I rece received it. So to me, being turned down, rejected. Oh, by the way, I told you that I, would, I applied for Harvard yeah. for 10 times, rejected. <laughs> I know I'll be rejected. Yeah, I just don't want to say that. <laughs> yeah, sorry now. <laughs> 10 times you wrote them and said, I'd like to come to Harvard. Yeah. 
And then I told myself, somebody I should go teach there, baby. <laughs> I remember I was playing a game with my nine-year-old son, John Leslie. And I beat him 10 straight games in a game called Connect Four. And finally, I said, John Leslie, I'm bored. I don't want to play you anymore. And I got up. I said, I'm ready to go to sleep now. And repeat after me, please. Let's say to this together. It's not over until I win. John Leslie said, no, you can't go now, Dad. I said, why? He said, it's not over until I win. That was his attitude. We sat down and we played several other games. And finally, after the 11th game, John Leslie won and he got up and he yawned. And he said, I'm ready to go to sleep now. And I'm saying to you, what if all of us took that attitude after we face a rejection and a no or we have a meeting and no one shows up or somebody say you can count on me and they don't come through what if we have that kind of attitude the cars repossessed nobody believes in you you've lost again and again and again the lights are cut off but you're still looking at your dream reviewing it every day and say to yourself it's not over until i win if i'm going to fall I don't want to fall back on anything except my faith. I want to fall forward. I figure at least this way I'll see what I'm going to hit. Fall forward. This is what I mean. Reggie Jackson struck out 2,600 times in his career, the most in the history of baseball. But you don't hear about the strikeouts. People remember the home runs. Fall forward. Thomas Edison conducted 1,000 failed experiments. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Because the 1,001st was the light bulb. Fall forward. Every failed experiment is one step closer to success. You've got to take risks, and I'm sure you've probably heard that before, but I want to talk to you about why that's so important. I got three reasons, and then you can pick up your iPhones. First, you will fail at some point in your life. Accept it. You will lose. You will embarrass yourself. You will suck at something. There's no doubt about it. And I know that's probably not a traditional message for a graduation ceremony, but hey, I'm telling you, embrace it, because it's inevitable. And I should know. In the acting business, you fail all the time. Early on in my career, I auditioned for a part in a Broadway musical. Perfect role for me, I thought, except for the fact that I can't sing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in the wings. I'm about to go on stage. But the guy in front of me, he's singing like, like, like Pavarotti. He's just, and he's just going on and on and on. And I'm just shrinking. I'm getting smaller and smaller. So they say, oh, thank you very much, thank you very much, and uh, you'll, we'll, we'll, you'll be hearing from us. So I, I come out with my little sheet music, and it, it, it was, it was uh, just my imagination by the Temptations. That's what I came up with. So I hand it to the, 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 the accompanist, and uh, she looks at it and looks at me and looks out at the director and was like, nice. So I, I start, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to sing. I'm like, uh, it's just my imagination once again and then coming away with me and then I'm not saying anything so I'm thinking I'm getting better so I, I could start getting into it it was just my imagination <laughs> running this oh, yeah, uh, th yeah, th thank you thank you thank you very much Mr. Washington thank you so I assumed I didn't get the job but the next part of the audition, he called me back. The next part of the audition is the acting part of the audition. Now I'm like, hey, okay, maybe I can't sing, but I know I can act. So they pair me with this guy, and again, I didn't know about musical theater. And musical theater is big, so they can reach everyone all the way in the back of the, of the stadium. And I'm more from a realistic, uh, naturalistic kind of acting where you, you, know, you actually talk to the person next to you. So I, I don't know what my line was. My line was, well, hand me the cup. And his line was, well, I will hand you the cup, my dear. The cup will be there to be handed to you. And I, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> he 
Well, should I give you the cup back? Oh, yes, you should give it back to me because you know that is my cup and it should be given back to me. I didn't get the job. But here's the thing. I didn't quit. I didn't fall back. I walked out of there to prepare for the next audition and the next audition and the next audition. I prayed. I prayed and I prayed. But I continued to fail and fail and fail. But it didn't matter because you know what? There's an old saying, you hang around the barbershop long enough, sooner or later you're going to get a haircut. So you will catch a break, and I did catch a break. Last year, I did a play called Fences on Broadway. Someone talked about it. Won the Tony Award. I, and I didn't have to sing, by the way. <laughs> but here's the kicker. It was at the court theater. It was at the same theater that I failed that first audition 30 years prior. There is another level. The only reason you keep saying there isn't is you feel so exhausted about where you are. But life, the universe, or God is just testing you because there is another level. If this is good, giant jump to excellence, giant jump, good, poor to good to excellence, there's a level where all your dreams are realized. There's a level that you've always dreamed about. It is real. It has not gone away. But it takes that extra burst when you think there's nothing left. There's no way. You've tried everything 10 million times, and you keep going. It's almost like God is saying, if you keep hitting this wall enough times, I will see that you will not stop, that you are filled with that level of determination, faith, and courage, and then the door opens, and you get to that next level. But what most people don't know is the next level is just two millimeters above. And it's called outstanding, ladies and gentlemen, outstanding. What's it called? What's it called? What's it called? Outstanding, magnificent, unstoppable, extraordinary, not excellent. It's a different level. It's a level where you are not one of the best, you are the best. And you know what's amazing? You only have to be two million millimeters more than everybody else and you get everything. You get the joy, the laughter, the fun, the family, the passion, the economics, the freedom, the spirit. It's all there. What Jerry Maguire called the Quan, baby. All of it. And it's just two million millimeters above and most excellent people give up because they're exhausted. And there's some people who go, the harder I hit it, the more I hit it, sooner or later it's going down. I'm not stopping. And when you do that enough, it pops open. And suffering is not like, you know, pain and all that stuff. It's a, suffering to me is on different levels. It's a level of how far am I willing to go? Like for me, I went through three hell weeks. And it's a long story behind that. I'm the only person in the history of the Navy SEALs to go through three hell weeks in one year. Hell weeks 130 hours of continuous training. You might get two hours of sleep. In my last hell week... The CEO looked at me, the commanding officer looked at me and he said, Goggins, this is your last time I'm putting you through this thing because, you know, you're losing life. You know, they say for 130 hours of hell week, you lose three to five years of your life because they literally beat the crap out of you. And I'm standing there with crutches. And he said, uh, this is your last time going through and you're only going to have about a few months to heal. 16 stress fractures, I had a hernia, double pneumonia, and I'm looking at him. And he goes, you're coming back in a few months to start again. You can't heal stress fractures up that fast. So what I did, this, is, this was my want. I wanted to be a SEAL. And most people think this was the craziest thing in the world. And I don't know if you have those pictures up here or not, but um, there's pictures of my feet going through Hell Week. But basically what I did was every morning at 3.30 in the morning, I would put my black sock on and I would put duct tape and I duct taped my feet all the way up to my, like the middle of my calf. And literally, for the first 45 minutes of my day, it was excruciating pain. I went through six months that way. With just literally not being able to move my ankle. And it caused me to jam 
my big toes in my boots and it caused pressure ulcers the size of quarters at the pivot point. And people go, why the hell did you do that? It's the want. Everybody's want is different. So to answer your question, it's how bad you want to be something. And everything comes at a price. It's hard changing your life. It was hard when just over three years ago, in the Penobscot building in Detroit, Michigan, where I was operating my business, and I fell on some hard times, and I was sleeping in my office. It was hard coming into the lobby, and the security said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, can we see you for a moment? And I said, yes, and I walked up to the counter, and he gave me an envelope. And he said, would you mind reading it here? And I opened the envelope, and the envelope was from management that said, this is an office tower. It's not a hotel. Please do not sleep in your office. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, I just work long hours in creating my business. I'm an entrepreneur. And right now, things are bad for me. But they're not going to be this way always. And I just asked for the opportunity to continue to operate like I'm doing. I'm not trying to make this my home. And it was hard coming through the lobby. And sometimes they would laugh. There's a guy talking about becoming successful. And look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at him. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams, and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I said, God, why, why is this happening to me? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my mother. I'm not trying to steal a rob from anybody. Why did this have to happen to me? It was very hard. And here's what I want to say to you. For those of you that have experienced some hardships, don't give up on your dream. No one could have convinced me by holding on, by continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded, but I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop running toward your dream. And now I said to the agent, the Hollywood agent, I want to get into movies. He said, <laughs> that's funny, Arnold. I ask a studio executive, I say, I want to get into movies. I want to be a leading man. He started laughing. So they all say, it's impossible. I say, why is it impossible? He says, because look at how big you are. You weigh 250 pounds. Hercules bodies and muscular bodies weighing 20 years ago. 20 years ago, they did Machista and they did all this. Uh, 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 Samson movies and Hercules movies and stuff like that, but not anymore. I know this is the 70s. Do you know the sex symbols today? It's Al Pacino. He weighs 150 pounds. It's Dustin Hoffman. He weighs 146 pounds. And guess who else is a sex symbol? Woody Allen. So imagine they're telling me now that those are the new sex symbols. So do you ever forget about it? And then they told me, this, and your accent, even if you reduce all your body weight and everything and have a normal body, your accent. I said, your accent, I mean, it will go give people goosebumps <laughs> with the German accent. It will get people the creeps. They will get scared. He says, no one in Hollywood ever has become a leading man that had an accent. Doesn't happen. 
people in America want to hear their actors talk like John Wayne or like Burt Reynolds or like Clint Eastwood. Not like someone on Hogan's Heroes or something like that, some Nazi movie. This is the kind of stuff that they heard. They said, no, you see, it's impossible. And plus your name, your name who can pronounce Schwarzen Schnitzel or something like that. No one can pronounce it, so forget about it, Arnold. This is the kind of thing that I heard. Imagine, you go from studio executive to studio executive, from agent to agent, from manager to manager, and they all said exactly the same thing. Now that's very encouraging, isn't it? But you know something? I didn't give a shit. Because I believed that I can be a leading man. I believed that I could be another Clint Eastwood, or another Burt Reynolds, or another Warren Beatty, or whatever those characters were, Charles Bronson, and so on. I believed that I could be those people. I said, there's enough room on that ladder that I can fit up there.